Hi everyone and welcome to Ugly Duck Market Insights. For the second year in a row we are holding this event online and as much as uh, we all got used to computer interface the communication and conferencing, I cannot wait to see you all back in real life as real persons at the next real Ugly Duck event. Mind you, if we look at the financial market evolution over the last past years, if there has been one market segment that appeared totally unimpressed and unaffected of the pandemic and the resulting financial crisis, it is venture capital. In uh, the minutes to come, I'm going to show you the insights from our venture capital portfolio as I did every year and going to guide you through uh, trends and performance indicators that we draw from this portfolio and try to interpret as good as I can what we can read from that for the uh, future to come. Now, let us start first with um, the uh, industry statistics as I shared them every time and every year since we started doing this exercise in 2017. And let me start with uh, the uh, performance comparison over the years uh, in terms of net IRR on our venture capital portfolio. As you can see on this uh, uh, chart, we have been uh, developing the returns as an industry more and more into positive territory and 2021 is no exception to that. Actually, as per our performance statistics uh, at the end of the third quarter of 2021, we read the same trend that we have seen over the years uh, 2017 to 2019, 2020, seeing performance figures of the venture capital portfolio moving more and more into positive territory. Actually, where we stand today, it appears unbelievable, but it is a fact that in order to enter the top quartile of the venture capital portfolio of the European Investment Fund, you need to display a net IRR performance of 25% plus. And this despite the fact that this portfolio does include our most risk tolerant investment resources that we are managing for backing emerging managers and making investments in emerging geographies. Now, let us look at um, the um, dynamics in terms of sectors that we can observe in the underlying portfolio as I did with you in the previous years. Actually, I was making is every year the comparison between the um, performance in the venture capital portfolio life sciences with the venture capital portfolio in ICT. You will remember that in the previous years, uh, the uh, venture capital uh, portfolio in life sciences has systematically taken a bigger space um, than its uh, share in the portfolio in the performance statistics of our top performing funds. This was even the case yet in uh, 2020 at uh, the figures that we published for December 2020, where uh, the life sciences portfolio had an overproportionate share in top performing funds compared to its representation in the uh, venture capital portfolio of EIF. For those who have seen my figures that I have talking uh, to and presenting as per uh, June 2021, you will remember that we had a trend uh, where ICT funds were regaining territory over the life sciences portfolio in uh, terms of those statistics. And this trend that we have been observing as per mid-2021 actually continues if we use the figures of September 2021. The life sciences portfolio actually retreats gradually from the top performing funds and ICT funds uh, gain a very, very solid majority in that category. Maybe worthwhile noting as well is for the first time in history, we see a fund not attributed to either the life sciences or the ICT portfolio that makes it to the top 10 performing funds. And that is a fund uh, active and focusing on the food tech sector. But um, for this year, I actually did not stop my analysis at this uh, mere comparison between life sciences and uh, ICT and taking the statistics in a standardized format as I did in previous years. But I actually wanted to make an analysis that looks a little bit on what would happen if we integrate in our analysis the same dynamic that we're observing in the market uh, in terms of the frenetic speed of deployment of capital that we see currently in the market environment. And just for fun, I was uh, violating one rule that we have been respecting 
for so many years because everybody was uh, reflecting on venture capital with um, the assumption that uh, the first years of every vintage year you can take out because of the J-curve effect that is happening in normal venture capital investment where you try to build a portfolio and gradually build up the value creation over time. Well, this year I actually tried to integrate the speed of market uh, development and the speed of capital deployment in the market by taking into our analysis also the vintage years of 2019 and 2020, provided that the funds that made it to the sample had at least 40% of their capital drawn. And um, here is what we actually uh, can observe from that. If we integrate into the portfolio sample the funds of the vintage year 2019 and 2020 that uh, have more than 40% uh, of their capital drawn, the return figures across the spectrum of the top 50 top performing funds of EIF make a gigantic jump. Surprisingly, this is not something that is only based on a few lucky punches, on a few outliers that we have in the portfolio. But actually, if I look at the population of funds of 2019 and 2020, who actually have drawn more than 40% of their capital already, we are talking about two thirds of the funds of vintage year 2019 and one third of the funds of the vintage year 2020. And that is actually a massive community of funds. Now, what does this mean in terms of evolution of the portfolio uh, characteristics that I've been sharing with you before? Well, actually, if we integrate into this uh, portfolio sample, the funds of vintage year 2020 and 2019, we may realize that life sciences will still retain the position of the top performing fund in the portfolio. But for the rest, life sciences basically disappears from the radar screen of the top performing funds in the EIF portfolio. And that is um, driven predominantly by the impact of the digital economy um, business models that have taken over the market. Values in this market segment are driven by infl infl inflation of uh, digital economy unicorns across the board and have outpaced the gradual value building of the life sciences portfolio that, as we know, is more dependent on uh, milestones in terms of clinical trial results and will uh, happen in a more structured way than it currently is the case in the ICT space. This being said, if we look at the realized investment performance, distributed capital to paid in, and we look at the ranking in that category, life sciences compared to their size in the portfolio continue to be overrepresented in terms of uh, performance uh, statistics. And surprisingly as well, or maybe not surprisingly, but uh, uh, inspiring to see for the first time in history, also on the, in terms of realized investment performance, we do see a food tech fund making it to the top 20 of our performance uh, uh, metrics in the venture capital portfolio. But uh, those are the figures that we can observe uh, from the uh, analysis that I did over the last um, uh, five years in a continuous way. As I said here, complemented with um, some um, tweaking on the vintage years 2019 and 2020. But I would like to um, also go a little bit into the return dynamics that derive uh, from that in our portfolio in terms of distribution. What you see in this uh, chart is uh, the distribution of vintage years in our top 50 performing funds. In our top 50 performing funds, you will realize that uh, the majority, actually 80% of the funds that make it to the top 50 performing funds of EF's portfolio come from the vintage years 2016 to 2020, which means that the bulk of our investment performance has been derived from that vintage year community. Even more so, if you look at it from the top 20 perspective, it is almost unbelievable that 75% of the top 20 best performing funds in the EIF portfolio are actually funds that are of the vintage years 2019 and 2020. Again, a reflection 
of the frenetic investment speed that we are looking at in the financial markets, in the uh, venture capital and private equity markets as we speak. Maybe one element to point out to as well, because uh, it is uh, something that is uh, very close to our heart at EIF, is also to see that the investment performance in top performing funds starts spreading across a wider spectrum of market players and geographies. It is no longer the privilege of the uh, uh, blue chip investment firms in the market to occupy the top performance uh, charts of uh, EIF's venture capital portfolio, but actually 50% of the top 50 funds are the realization of uh, the investment performance of fund managers that we qualify as emerging managers. And nine out of those 50, which is close to 20%, are actually happening in what we call emerging venture capital geographies. And this, I think, for the depth of the industry is a very encouraging sign. Now, what does that mean in terms of um, the dynamics of return in our portfolio when we compare life sciences and ICT investments um, again in terms of uh, value creation? You will remember maybe the statistics that I've shared with you at the end of uh, 2020, when we were comparing life sciences and ICT in terms of realized returns and unrealized returns. What you see on those charts is that uh, at that time, we had uh, both of those communities in terms of total value to paid in, meaning total value creation. Um, we had a uh, almost parity statistically between those two investment samples. Mind you, at the level of realized returns, the venture capital portfolio in life sciences outperformed massively the ICD investment portfolio with a DPI of 0.74 compared to 0.34 in ICT. Let us look at what this investment statistic, this performance statistic looks like if we just move the timeline by nine months to September 2021. If you look first at the life sciences portfolio, we see that this market segment has been remaining largely in line with what we've seen before. We've got a realized return multiple of uh, 0.78, and we've got a DVPI of 1.61, which is slightly below the one that we have observed in uh, the uh, um, sample for as per uh, December 2020. But uh, this is largely due to the increased investment volume uh, in the market, which has been diluting previous returns. If we make the same analysis for the ICD portfolio, we do see two things. First of all, we see that the realized return of the ICD portfolio is catching up. And it would mean that probably we would say that it is about time that it does because uh, it is moving from 0.34 to 0.53 in the uh, investment performance statistics. But more importantly is to see what happens in the unrealized return portfolio of the ICD segment. If we look at the figure of total value to paid in capital in the ICD venture segment, we see that it is jumping in a period of nine months from December 2020 to September 2021 from 1.68 to 2.31. And this, this is something that has been happening uh, predominantly driven by the uh, almost unlimited success of fundraising and uh, market attention captured by unicorns in the digital economy business. This evolution of unicorns in our portfolio deserves maybe an even closer look. Because obviously, what happens in terms of market speed and market uh, um, investments in the different market segments is one thing to know. But the second thing that is so interesting for us is to what extent does that affect the resilience of our returns and our portfolio? And one of those factors of resilience is the factor of uh, how much of uh, our value that we have generated through our investments 
is concentrated in what type of um, depth of the portfolio. And uh, if we look at it uh, from that perspective, I start again with something that I've been sharing with you earlier this year based on performance statistics that are uh, including the reports as per June 2021. At that time, we had 133 unicorns in our portfolio, representing 2% of our uh, total number of investees in the underlying portfolios. And they were generating 22% of the total value of our portfolio. Only three months later, we have 204 unicorns in our portfolio. They are representing 3% of our um, total number of investees. And those 204 unicorns in our portfolio represent 27% of uh, the total net asset value of EIF's venture portfolio. This is a massive increase, and uh, I can tell you from the perspective of uh, today, uh, January uh, 2022, that uh, in um, this um, evolution since, this, since September 2021, this trend has not been broken. Now, obviously, the question is, can this evolution last? And what is triggering this market evolution? Well, I guess um, we all are aware that uh, somehow the capital flows, the money flows in the venture capital industry and in the financial market segment in general have spun out of control. We know that uh, by now in the US American market, the median pre-money valuation for D rounds and later in venture capital have crossed the bar of 1 billion US dollars in valuation. We also have the most recent industry statistics in from the fundraising activity in US and in Europe. And in the US, for the first time in history, the fundraising of venture capital funds in a year has crossed the mark of 100 billion US dollars. All stages and market segments report uh, record inflows of capital into their market segment for the year 2021. And this is just the venture capital industry with the standard traditional fundraising processes. But next to this, there has been an other evolution coming to the market, which is the famous phenomenon of SPACs. And as you can see from this chart here, in 2021, we had uh, a total of 613 SPACs raising 161 billion US dollars, and in doing so, have been outpacing the fundraising collectively of the US American and the European venture capital industry. And this money, as much as the record fundraising that we've seen on the venture capital fund side, is waiting for investment opportunities to be invested in. Now, how does this bode for the outlook of our industry? How did we actually get there and how did we sustain that for that long? Well, we all know that this market environment is driven by a liquidity uh, access in the market. And the excess of liquidity has been caused by the uh, attempts of central banks to combat the uh, outflow of the financial crisis in the first place and has actually triggered a, a massive um, inflow of capital through quantitative easing that has been lasting basically since the big financial crisis in 2009. The problem that we are seeing is that uh, uh, as much as money has been made available to the economy, it did not end up in the economy. Rather than being spent in the real economy, this market uh, capitalization or this market inflow of capital has been stocked, stocked up in capital markets and uh, spent on trading between um, financial assets rather than being spent in the real economy. And despite the massive amount of capital that has been flowing into the industry, there has been very little that has been spent in the real economy to reestablish economic growth. 
that has led to a uh, emergence of basically parallel economies. On one side, we had the economy of the financial markets that were actually chasing one record after the other, inflating valuations on stock markets, as well as in the private equity and venture capital space, as we all know. And at the same time, the impact on the real economy in terms of uh, economic growth, in terms of effect on unemployment and the like, has not been great and has even been tempered by the impact of the pandemic that we've been experiencing over the last two years. This tide is about to change. We all know that uh, by now, the uh, inflationary tendencies that we have seen in the valuations of the stock markets and financial markets as a whole have arrived in the real economy. And despite the fact that the central banks are telling us this is going to be a temporary phenomenon and this is going to be something that goes away in a very limited period of time, the likelihood is that this is not the case. And actually, rather than being retracting money from the uh, economy, we probably will spend even more because we all know that with all the decisions that we are currently taking at political level, in order to enable the climate transition, we will actually have to spend a huge amount of money to replace assets that are incompatible with this climate agenda and need to be substituted in the very near future. And that means that money will be redirected from the financial markets into the real economy and will lead to an, a kind of closing of the gap between the imaginary valuations that we've seen in the financial markets on one side and the real valuations that we are seeing in the um, uh, real economy uh, sustained by uh, economic flows at the level of businesses. Now, how we are going to react this as GPs and how we are going to react this as investor community investing in GPs? Well, if we look at the GPs, and th that is something that we can also draw as an evidence from our portfolio, the GPs actually have adopted in different strategies to this market environment. Some have actually adopted the um, strategy of invest and run. And what I was just showing to you in terms of investment speed in our portfolio with vintage years 2019 and 2020, which previously we typically would have excluded of, a, of the sample of, of an analysis in 2021 because of the J curve, they actually have invested in one year or in a year and a half what they typically would have invested previously in three or four years. So one strategy is to invest and run and hope that you get in, yes, at expensive prices, but you also get, up, get out of the investment in the same valuation cycle and manage to realize the performance that is driven by an overheated market. The other strategy is to actually try to balance out the valuation cycle and to go uh, with a diversified approach over vintage years and try to build a portfolio slowly and be over or underexposed in one year of uh, over or, or undervaluation and balancing that out with other vintage years that you're covering in your investment strategy. Which one of those strategies is the right? Time will tell. But um, how should you deal with that from the perspective of an investor of an LP? Is this the right time to go into the market? Is this an environment where you should still seek exposure to venture capital? Well, it is probably fair to say that um, safe advice is in financial markets, don't try to time the market because it never works. Imagine you would have taken a conservative approach to the discussion that we had on valuations back in 2015, when everybody said that the market were overheated. Imagine you went out of the market at that period of time you would have lost probably 50% of value uplift on your portfolio. So the only way to deal with this market environment actually is to think long term and to stay committed in the long term. We all know that the financial markets are a game of a musical chair. And venture capital is no exception to this. No matter how loud the music, no matter how fast we dance, when the music stops, 
there will be one chair less than people in the room. But we also know that the music will start again. <laughs>